same sex, same sex attraction, same sex marriage. Well, what does God have to say about all that? Does God ever say it's okay or not? I'm Dr. Carol. We're going there today, and I have a very special guest to talk about that. I want to begin by saying that this is a volatile topic in culture and in the church. I also want to say right up front that I hold to what many would call the traditional Christian sexual ethic, that God designed sex to be between one man and one woman within the covenant of marriage. And outside of that, sex is not to be used, that that is the only place for sex. But how that works out in culture, in the church, and most importantly, in individual lives, has a lot of nuance, a lot of weight, sometimes a lot of pain. My conversation partner in this fascinating episode is Preston Sprinkle. I have been looking forward to talking with him, and this is uh, his area of, uh, of focus. Preston is a biblical scholar, speaker, podcaster, Theology and the Raw podcast, and I listen to many of his episodes. He's the co-founder and president of the Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender. He is a best-selling author. Today, we are focusing our conversation on his book, Does the Bible Support Same-Sex Marriage? 21 Conversations from a Historically Christian View. I want to also let you know up front that Preston shares with me that historically Christian view of what God intended sex to be. But this is a, a nuanced, a theological, and a ministry-oriented conversation. First of all, we're talking about some of the reasons these topics are so hot. Then we talk about some of the particular pushbacks that people give with to that idea that God designed sex and marriage between a man and a woman, and what are the arguments against that, and then responding to some of those arguments. I believe you will really, really like this conversation. Preston Sprinkle. Well, Preston Sprinkle, we've already had a great few minutes even <laughs> off camera. Thank you. Welcome to the program. It's my pleasure. I've been looking forward to this. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Um, the first question that I just would love to know for myself is mm -hmm. how did you get into this really challenging area of mm -hmm. sexuality and same sex and now yeah. transgender? I mean, just this whole thing. How did you even get into this? Well, the, I'll give you the short story is I, I sort of just fell into it um, out of a uh, scholarly interest. Um, you know, but as, as just over a decade ago, I was teaching at a Bible college. I'm I'm a, you know, a, a Bible scholar by trade. That's my passion. I love reading scholarly books and writing stuff like that, you know? Um, and I just was, I've been on a journey my whole life to figure out what does the Bible actually say? What I mean by that is I knew what I grew up believing and, and right. people telling me what it said, but I just been passionate. It's why I did a PhD in Bible to figure out, I want to know for myself, what does the Bible say? So I've been kind of ch checking off all the boxes of, okay, grew up believing this. And I've, you know, I've, I've kind of figured out what the Bible says about this and then, you know, next, next topic, next topic. And sure enough, the question of uh, homosexuality, same-sex marriage, you know, was coming up in, in, in my ministry and in the college I was teaching at in my own life. And so I just started studying it on a academic level. What does the yeah. Bible actually say about this? Um, early on in my research, though, I started to get to know uh, LGBT people, many of whom were raised in the church. And um, it was really those stories that I would say pretty radically reshaped, not what I believe the Bible, not what I think the Bible says, but it reshaped how I go about the conversation. Yeah. Story after story after story of rejection, of shame, of hurt, of sometimes intentional spiritual abuse, sometimes unintentional, you know, really dehumanizing things that Christians have said. And, and I was like, man, we can get the Bible right, but if we get love wrong, then, then we're also wrong, you know? And so uh, I do think the Bible uh, teaches that marriage is between a man and a woman and that yep. all sex outside of that, of, of that covenant bond or sin. Um, yep. Yep. So I hold to what people call a traditional view of marriage. And I hold that very passionately. I think the Bible clearly teaches that. But I also think the church could could do much better in in the posture in which we hold to those views, and I think we do, we can do a much better job loving and 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 caring for and listening to and learning from uh, LGBT people. Yeah, 
I think that is so important. And one reason that I was really looking forward to this conversation with you, because part of my scientific and the, the doctor part of me um, has been fascinated by some of the neurobiology that has mm. come out in the last 20, 30 years. I'm not a neurologist, I'm an OBGYN, um, yeah. but, but I kind of geek out over this stuff and I've come to understand more and more about the difference between right brain and left brain and stuffing facts into mm. people's left brains doesn't change them. And, and you, mm. you talk yeah. about that, frankly, in, in the first chapter of your book. I'm paraphrasing a bit, but that just seems like such a big deal. And the church hasn't generally done very well with that. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because you are way more of an expert in <laughs> the, the science side of things. So I just have gathered over the years and I've read a lot of psychological studies and, you know, on just why people believe what they do and how people, people even change their minds on certain things. So I, I really, um, that might be the most unique part of this book, uh, maybe yeah. unexpected from people, look, you know, looking at the the title. Um, but one, it's probably that first chapter that I, I might personally be most excited about. And it, yeah. so it's titled, you know, how to have a profitable conversation. And it, you know, I just emphasize that how we go about having these contentious conversations is almost as important as the beliefs we hold onto. Um, you know, if you're in a, if you're in a conversation with somebody, I don't know about politics or, or yeah. climate change or same sex marriage, you know, um, are you able to be a good listener to, uh, be curious about the other person's viewpoint, even if you just fundamentally feel like you disagree with it, if you're not genuinely curious about their point of view, what makes you think they're going to be curious about your point of view? Yes. Um, can you be, um, can you hold your view with a bit of an open hand saying, here's where I'm at based on the study I've done, but I could have something wrong. Can we have the humility to hold our beliefs while recognizing the fragility of our humanity? And we could be, you know, um, missing some, some things. So I think having, holding, it's, it's, just, it's, it's this, I think a really beautiful tension of holding to your convictions with conviction and being passionate about what the Bible says. And yet also recognizing our, our humanity and somebody else's humanity and, and trying to honor people, even when there's a, a degree of disagreement. So that's what the, the whole first chapter is like, before we even get into theology, yeah. what kind of posture do we need to cultivate and how we go about having these conversations? And that really resonates with me because how often have you seen people change by just hammering them with facts or truth, as yeah. many people in, in the church say? And with you, I agree with truth 100%. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but hammering somebody with that, when has that changed what they really believe in their soul? Mm -hmm. Somebody who read the chapter early on said, this is kind of just the golden rule of yeah. arguments and debates, like do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So if yeah. Really, that's what the whole first chapter is basically like, how would you want somebody else to treat you when you're yeah. trying to explain your viewpoints? You would want them to be genuinely listening, to ask good questions, to not be, you know, to not just be interrogative. And what about this? What about that? Or trying to find the worst possible interpretation of your words. That's something that drives me so crazy. I hate it when people, you know, I'll say... I'll talk for 10 minutes and they'll find that one phrase and they'll take it in the worst possible direction. I'm like, you weren't really trying to understand what I was saying, you know? So if we don't like it when people do that to, that, to us, we shouldn't do that to other people. We shouldn't just straw man the other viewpoint, make it look yeah. as worse as it possibly could, can. Um, we should, as I say in the book, steel man it. What's the best argument for the other position? Let, let's, yeah. let's present that. And then if it's, if it's still wrong, then we should still be able to show why it's wrong. Um, but there's no, there's nothing, there's nothing's gained at just making the other viewpoint or person look silly or foolish or, you know. Yeah. yeah. You also yeah. talk a bit about just how that works out in practice. And, and that's another step that I care a lot about. Um, I can believe certain truths. I can believe the mm -hmm. Bible says X in scientifically, you know, my left brain. But how does that move into practice? And the uh, the, the pastoral part of you, the, the the Christian minister part of you, talk about that for a second, because I'm yeah. sure you also have seen a lot of people who believe things and that really isn't playing out in the way mm -hmm. they live day to day. 
Yeah, I, that's such a great question because yes, this has been a big part of the last 10 years yes. in my ministry. Here's something, this is, I guess it's, it's, it's very relevant to what you're asking. So I spend a lot of time with um, Christians who are same-sex attracted. Some might even call themselves gay. Some might not like that term, but they, they're they're um, they're committed to a, a, a traditional view of marriage. So the, some some of them are committed to celibacy. Some of them are in, in a a marriage to the opposite sex, even though they are uh, same sex attracted. Mm -hmm. So that would be, and and that's not an insignificant number. In fact, according to one survey, there's five hundred thousand people in the United States alone that are same sex wow. attracted, and yet. They don't believe in same-sex marriage. That's still a small percentage of LGBT people sure. as a whole, but but it's still it's not. I mean, half a million people. That's a lot of people trying to navigate their faith and sexuality in really difficult ways. And in my journey with a lot of people who would fit that description, you know, there's people that end up changing their view. They they once held to a traditional view of marriage, and then they end up affirming same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. In almost every case where somebody changed their view from, from not affirming same-sex marriage to affirming same-sex marriage, it has something to do with how the more conservative brands of evangelical churches have treated them. Mm -hmm. um, we police their language, you know, we, we still have this fear. It's like, okay, well, we'll let you be a member, but you can't serve in children's ministry, mm -hmm. giving the impression that we think you're a pedophile or, you know, there's just all, all kinds or, or, yeah, I guess you're a Christian, but you still need to, you know, become straight or just we we just the the, the conservative Christian environment. And again, I don't say that like I hold to traditional views on many things, um, but just the environment we've created where there is just still a lot of fear and kind of othering of yeah. people simply because they have this unwanted attraction to the same sex. We we just we really need this. So the pastoral part of me is also related to the theological part of me. Yes, we need to recognize that it's our lack of a healthy Christ-like posture that is playing a role in driving some people to embracing same-sex marriage. And then we we can't just say, "See, you know, they, they're we knew that they're liberal all along." It's like, well, hold on, let let's 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 look more deeply at some cultural things that we can really change in order to make the traditional view of marriage not just true, but make it more compelling and beautiful. Yeah. Know? That's good. That's good. I'm thinking of someone I would call a friend of, of mine right now, a gentleman. He has been married to his wife for decades, but has struggled with same-sex attraction for all those years. And now, even decades into his marriage, although he and his wife love each other, mm -hmm. he struggles with deep, deep, deep shame. He yeah. feels like nobody in the church really knows him and he struggles yeah. to find any place to feel safe mm -hmm. and known because of the, exactly the kind of things that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That breaks my heart. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that that doesn't require any theological change. Yeah. Uh, it does yeah. require a posture change, a yes. relational change, uh, uh, you know, a change in how we view just people through the lens of Christ. And honestly, that what you just described, I, I, almost every single uh, same-sex attracted Christian that I know, or just gay person who was even raised in a church sure. would say almost the exact same thing. Mm. There is this deep, profound sense of shame, even if they are, again, holding to traditional, yes. theo traditional yes. theology of marriage, there still is this yes. deep in their bones, almost like, ah, but God probably still thinks I'm disgusting because I think the church yes. thinks I'm disgusting. And yes. man, we just, when we realize that that that's just a, that's a game changer relationally. When we realize, man, we can we can do some really simple things to help alleviate um, to help. How about this? To help mediate Christ <laughs> relieving of their shame that He yes. took on, on the cross. So yeah, that's yes. a great. I'm glad. I'm glad you have that friend. That's a great. That's a great thing. Yeah, um, we're talking about homosexuality, same sex attraction, gay, mm -hmm. and and the terms are important, but. Mm -hmm. they yeah. are nuanced it seems to me that that has been a incredibly hot issue especially mm -hmm. among christians in recent years same-sex attraction has been around we know for at least a few millennia yeah. um and so it, it it's not new there are other sexual sins and i could mm -hmm. name some um <laughs> why 
do you, do you have an opinion on why this has been such a divisive and for many painful area of mm. I'm going to use the word sexual brokenness. I'm not sure, sure. that's the right phrase, but yeah, I, I think it's fine as long as we're all sexually broken on some level. Yes, so correct. Uh, same sex attraction would be part of sexual brokenness as a whole. Yeah. Um, what? Well, yeah, you know, I, that's, um, there's probably several layers to an answer that I can give. And, and it is, it is, I'm glad you said my opinion. Cause I, you know, I'm not a expert Correct. sociologist or, but you yep. know, there, there has been j just briefly, you know, historically gay and lesbian people. I, I know right now in 2023, you know, it seems like everywhere you look in culture, everybody is just, you know, throwing this in your face and just celebrating it, yep. and, you know, Hollywood and culture and music and everything. It just seems like everything is so pro LGBT and Christians get all upset at that. And, and I, I, yeah, I, I'm like, I don't like people throwing anything in my face that, that, you know, like that. But if you just kind of look at the history though, for, for so many decades, like LGBT people were just the, the, the butt of um, people's jokes um, publicly, you know, you look at like old episodes of like Archie Bunker, you look at what was said in, in the political realm, all the way from like the AIDS crisis in the eighties and people shaking their fingers saying, this is God's judgment on homosexuals, you know, yeah. while people were dying in the hospital, you know, with this horrible disease. And just, there's just been decades and decades and decades of both cultural stigmatization uh, stigmatization and and oppression both from the culture and from the church maybe especially from the church so you do that if, if just here's my sociologist you had on yeah. you know you just yeah. you just take any kind of culture and and when uh, the dominant people group do that to a minority group for so long after a while they just kind of get sick of it so if there has been an overcorrection an overreaction maybe anger even pride parades you know where people are like almost you know, so passionate. This is who I am. You know, it's like, okay, I can get annoyed at the surface of that, or I can say, you know what, where's that coming from? And there is a complex yes. history here. So, um, I, so I think, I think there just has to answer your question, you know, why is this such a volatile, sensitive topic? I, I think there's, I think understanding that, that, that really complex history is, is important. Mm -hmm. And also people, you know, I, I, I don't believe that our sexuality is our fundamental identity. I think, you know, we yes. are primarily humans created in God's image. And I think our culture inside and outside the church does make probably too much out of sexuality as far as, as far as being such a, you know, the essence of who you are yeah. at the same time, it's still a pretty big part. <laughs> it, it's not insignificant. It's not like my, you know, my, my love for diet Coke or something. I mean, it's, it's a bigger yeah. part of that, you know, yep. Um, so I, I, yeah, so, so we are dealing with questions about significant aspects of someone's humanity, even if we, we also want to acknowledge it's not the most fundamental part of, of who you are. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great, I don't, I don't, I'm just kind of thinking out loud a bit, but yeah, that's well, a, I, that, that was my reason for the question. Cause I, yeah, your perspective, but still, um, it, it gives people like you, and in some dimension, perhaps me and, and, and others, just um, a, an area of both ministry and challenge and um, a lot of pain. Sometimes I wonder, why is the church so hot about same-sex sexuality, but isn't hot about other things like, you know, um, we, we all know about some of the sexual abuse scandals among Christian leadership in the evangelical mm -hmm. church or people shacking up to use one phrase, mm -hmm. um, somebody with the opposite sex, but that doesn't seem to have the same kind of um, volatility. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I, I don't think that is right. I, I, well, you're, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head here. Well, one of the, well, first of all, it, it's easy to vilify sins you don't struggle with. And when yep. the majority of people in the church don't struggle with same-sex attraction, it's easy to see that as some other thing out there. That's, that's number one. Um, number two, I think hypocrisy in how the church has gone about this conversation is a huge issue. It's yeah. a huge issue. Yeah. Now, some people will say, well, wait a minute, the divorce rates through the roof. You have sex outside of marriage, all, all the stuff you mentioned, porn, you know, and, and and some people say, therefore, why why are we making this a big deal? I'm like, well, I don't think 
Jesus would say, you know, well, you guys are really screwing up in this area, so you might as well just open up the floodgates on whatever sexual ethic you want. I, I think what we should do is say, all right, let's both, you know, um, hold to a traditional view of marriage because I think that's God's design, and also hold to that holistically, you know, yeah. and, and really pay attention and 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 live by um, God's design as a whole. And when we mess up, let's have the humility to say, gosh, I, yeah, I really screwed up in this area. Yeah. There was a study done a while back on the religious background of LGBT people, and it showed that 83 percent of LGBT people were raised in the Christian church. Eighty three percent. That's wow. huge. Wow. Um, and 51 percent ended up leaving the church by the time they were 18. Um, and the survey asked several questions like, why did you leave? And one of the number one reasons, I think it was like maybe top, maybe the top third reason was the hypocrisy in the church. It wasn't simply theological disagreement. It was like, look, I'm being told the church is a hospital for, uh, you know, yeah. uh, sinners, not a not a, a museum for saints or whatever, however the phrase goes. But I'm looking yeah. around and everybody seems like they have their life all together. But I, I, I talk to people. I know half the youth group is having sex outside of marriage. I know half of the elders are struggling with porn. I know yep. several deacons yep. who have been divorced and remarried, and yep. I don't think it fit the biblical criteria. Yeah. And they're like, hey, if, if we can just admit that we're all screwed up, that would be okay. But when everybody else kind of says, no, we're kind of fine, but how dare Target do this? Let's boycott them. Let's do this. And we're yeah. like, wait a minute, what are we doing here? Like, it just seems so kind of like we're picking on one sin while ignoring many others. So yeah, I think um, one of the beauties of the LGBT conversation becoming front and center is it's turned a mirror into the church and saying, what do we need to clean up in our own closets, you know? Yeah. Well, let's uh, focus a little bit more on some of what you wrote in your latest book. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I just would love you to clarify a bit, you talk about how sex difference, meaning a man and a woman, is part mm -hmm. of what marriage is. Yeah. And as we get into a few of these specifics, I think that would be really helpful to unpack for a minute. That is the most fundamental and basic theological question in this debate. And when I say debate, meaning the debate over is same-sex marriage blessed by God or not? Yes. Um, the main question is not, can two people the same sex get married according to God's design? The main question, I mean, that's an important question, but the main question is, what is marriage? When we talk right. about marriage, what is it we're even talking about? Because I think, and this is something, it's fascinating how really smart people who have written books on this topic, they just skip right over that question. They talk about same-sex marriage, this, and same-sex relationships. I'm like, well, let's first get our definitions down. What is marriage? Yeah. And how does scripture support our definition of marriage? Because there's different views of what the term marriage even means. So yeah, I, I, I do put that front and center in the second chapter in the book saying, you know, the main question is, is sex difference an essential part of this concept, this institution we call marriage? Yes. And I show from scripture, I, I think it is. Uh, Genesis 2, Matthew 19, Mark 10, Ephesians 5, several passages. When they talk, when it talks about this one flesh union that we call marriage, it sex difference, male and female, is a necessary part of forming that one flesh union. And if if that's true, then really theologically, that's that I don't want to say that ends the discussion, but I mean that that's a significant yeah. theological point. If it's not true, if if God does can bless same sex unions as marriages then we should show from scripture that sex difference while maybe the most common form of marriage isn't essential to what marriage is. And so yep. I, I just have, as I say in the book, you know, I, I consider all the pushbacks to that and other ways in which people try to argue that. I just, I just, I don't see a compelling biblical case for that view that sex difference is not mm -hmm. an essential part of what marriage is. You don't start with the prohibitions against same sex activity in scripture. No. And we, we can get into a little of that. You start with, um, creation and how Jesus and writers yeah. throughout scripture continue to come back to that original design. Mm -hmm. God made them male and female and just, you know, where that connects with marriage and mm -hmm. that that really is core. I think, I, I think you're right on there. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, I, it's so common for people to go to, they started Leviticus, you know, mm -hmm. they started Romans one, some of these passages that speak, 
negatively about same-sex sexual relationships. And then they say, well, Paul must have been talking about something else or whatever. And those are all very important and interesting. And I, yes. you know, address many of those in, in the book. But at the end of the day, the main question we're asking is a creational, it's a, it's a creational question. How has the creator designed humans to relate to one another on a sexual level? And he created this institution called marriage. I think it's at least partly for the bearing of children and the sex difference is a necessary uh, part of that. So um, again, we, we, I'm fine with people pushing back and disputing that, but at least let, let's make sure that that's the primary, the, the, at least the starting point of this yeah. theological conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have 21 conversations addressing some of the uh, pushback about mm -hmm. that view of, of marriage and we're not going to be able to get to all of them <laughs> but 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 a couple that that kind of stood out to me um you talk about um sex versus intimacy and and this wasn't mm -hmm. how you originally framed the pushback but this quote just really uh resonated with me humans can live without sex but we can't live without love and intimacy Mm -hmm. And you put that in one of your responses to one of the challenges to mm -hmm. um, the, if we could say, uh, man-woman view that that is what marriage is. Mm -hmm. But talk about that mm -hmm. heart piece and the difference between sex and love, intimacy. Yeah. <laughs> that That's such an, uh, that's, that's an, another very fundamental part of this conversation that is oftentimes missed. Uh, you know, that quote actually comes from, it's kind of of a, of a, a conglomeration of many different um, same-sex attracted Christians committed to celibacy yeah. that have used that phrase. Um, they say, they, yeah, I can live without sex, but if I can't find love and intimacy in the church, this doesn't seem like a livable vocation, living a dedicate, you know, living a life of singleness yep. and celibacy, even though the, the desire is to get married and, and, you know, or have a same sex partner. Sure. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, and this also plays into the, the argument, you know, isn't love, love, why would God prevent yep. people to love who they're wired to love? And sometimes the word love is thrown around as a synonym for a romantic or sexual relationship. And that's where I really want to make a, a distinction there between, you know, love as agape love as christ loving us uh, as uh then there's intimacy which is a you know a kind of a kind of love um then there's romantic intimacy which is another kind of love there's sexual intimacy and not, some of these overlap obviously and sure, but i, I just sure. i just want to um not reduce the biblical category of agape love or even human intimacy i don't want to reduce that to a sexual relationship, a sexual relationship, romantic relationship can be a form of that, but you can find intimacy and love without having a sexual relationship. And we know that for the obvious reason that Jesus himself, yes. um, the one who flourished most as a human being, yes, he's God, yes. obviously, but he's also hundred percent human and um, never had a sexual relationship. But would we say Jesus never experienced intimacy? I mean, of course he did. Uh, did he, he, did he, he sought not? it. He 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 <laughs> sought it, and it was often broken. It did. It wasn't always reciprocated. But he needed right. it. He sought right. it, and like you're just alluding to, would we want to say that Jesus would have been more fully human, more fully alive, if he right. had had sex? I certainly don't want to say that. Right. I don't right. think there's right. anything in Scripture that would give us grounds to say that. Yeah. And something that people don't realize, especially those of us raised in in more of a purity culture kind of background, you yeah. know. Where, you know, and I, I don't want to open up another can of worms, but, you know, I, I I was raised in a kind of a church context where it was just kind of assumed that if you were a good Christian person, God would bless you with a spouse. And if you didn't have sex before marriage, there's kind of this transactional reward of you will have a flourishing sex life in marriage. And, and you know, some of these messages were communicated explicitly, some, you know, unintentionally, whatever, yeah. but like, I just grew up believing that if everything goes right in my life, I'll be married by 25, you know, like that's part of the promise of the gospel is what I assumed. <laughs> then you read the new Testament. There's not a shred of biblical evidence that God says, okay, if you put your faith in me, right. I'll bless you with eternal life, forgiveness of sins, and a wonderful spouse who will satisfy all your sexual needs. Like yep. this is not part of the promise. It's a possibility. Yep. It's a high calling for probably many people, most people, but um, it's never built into the gospel promise. So that that's before we even talk, talk about 
same sex marriage, opposite sex marriage, whatever. I think understanding that sex and sexual intimacy is not essential for an individual human to flourish. Yeah. I don't think we believe that, honestly. I think that's a hard sell. But I'm as a theologian, I'm just saying, I'm just trying to help us understand what God has revealed through scripture. Whether you yeah. find that to be believable or not, that's on you, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's an important part of the conversation. Yeah. I heard John Mark Comer on a podcast interview one time, and this wasn't the topic of the interview, but he was talking about assumptions and lies that we've come to believe. And he said that he, you know, he he has had to dealt with just the cultural assumption that you have to have a happy sex life to be fulfilled and whole. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Really? But we assume it uh, yeah. without even questioning. And and I'm glad that you are bringing this to light. And you talk about some of these assumptions as reducing love to sex. Yes. And yes. I thought that was really important that love is, love is bigger. Um, and, and the idea that, that, just limiting it to sex is actually a reduction. Yes, yes. Yeah, it does kind of cheapen the agape love. Yep. Agape is, you know, the Greek word for love used throughout scripture. It kind of cheapens the the holistic power of what love is. I mean, you know, if I can be cr- not crass, but just explicit, you know, when Christ commanded us to love our neighbors, he didn't mean go have sex with our neighbors, you know, yep. or even Christ, when he poured out his love on us, doesn't mean he had a sexual relationship with us. So, um, and and yeah, I, I do think, and and here's where I you know I I don't want to get uh, beyond my skis with my knowledge base, but I think I think just sociologically, it is kind of a more modern Western view of marriage and rom- romance and sex that kind of sees it as just absolutely essential to flourish as a human being, and you can't you know function as a human unless you're having a flourishing sex life. Like I do think that that's a a fairly modern Western. Yes. way of thinking about it you know i, I read a book by a, um oh stephanie i'm looking at my bookshelf here stephanie kuntz she's a secular historian but it's on a whole history of marriage and she looks at all these phases and history and how marriage you know in in ancient times was kind of transactional and it was political yeah. then it was a, a show of power and then it was you know a way of bonding families and more recently it's kind of more romantic you know romance and just kind of at least said it, let's not assume that like our current view of marriage and romance is kind of like like we finally arrived at like the perfect view of marriage. Like there are cultural factors here that shape our view of marriage and sex. Yeah. And I want to get back to, okay, those are, you know, maybe they're neutral, whatever, but um, let's get back to God's vision for what marriage is and what it's for. Yeah. And we could spend hours talking about that, but um, that such foundational pieces of love and what mm-hmm. we need as humans. And it plays into this same sex and same sex marriage um, debate mm-hmm. or conversation. Couple other things. One, you talk about how people who are seeking to follow what they understand as God's design, that sex be between one man and one woman in marriage, that they are same sex attracted mm-hmm. and they are not in a marriage or feel like they can marriage to the opposite sex. Long phrase to describe, but but many of those people feel like they are they are on the out they don't have a community Hmm. and are are, would you talk about for example a parent considering their you know teen or or young adult child um if they are going to leave their lgbtq community to come to the church uh, are the the isolation are 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 they going to get less life less connection i mean that kind of question the need yeah. for community and what that mm-hmm. says uh, about the church. And part of that applies to one of the debates and the, one conversations that following this understanding of what God designed sex and marriage and relationships to be is harmful to LGBT yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. That that's one of the more powerful arguments um, yeah. in this debate. It comes up all the time that the traditional yeah. view of marriage is harmful toward uh, gay and lesbian um, people. You know, you have somebody who's attracted to the same sex and they're exploring Christianity. Maybe they're already committed to, to Christ. And if if they're told you cannot marry somebody of the same sex, then that view is going to be harmful toward them. And, you know, I, I, I'm very sympathetic. I'm sympathetic to a lot of aspects of all these arguments. In fact, every in every one of these 21 arguments that I respond to, I always begin by saying, can I find something in the argument that I resonate with that I think yes. is 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 true? I think that's good to do. And with this one, I'm like, man, I've got loads of friends, 
LGBT friends raised in a church who did experience some level of harm. Sometimes, I mean, I, I'm talking like all the way horror stories of of friends being um, sexually abused when people found out that they were same sex attracted. I mean, horror, just just twisted stuff by leaders, and I mean, just horrible stuff all all the way to maybe some un, unintentional harm. You know, just people just kind of giving an air of othering them. You know, and they can yes. we, we feel it when somebody kind of just feels like you're just somebody kind of you're just different you're out there you know yep so i I, now that absolutely shatters my heart and drives me to do what i do i'm trying to help the church cultivate a better culture in this conversation um now as a theological argument i i don't think it works to say people who hold to a traditional view have done harmful things to lgbt people therefore the traditional view of marriage is is wrong i'm like well hold on that's now we're confusing correlation with causation. Um, it might be that some Christians have done harmful things and that those Christians also hold to a traditional view. That's correlation. But is the, does that mean the traditional view is causing these Christians to do harmful things? I, I, don't, I don't think that really holds weight as a, as a theological argument. The main question we should ask is not, do we think this view, this theological doctrine is harmful? The main question is, first of all, is it true? Like we need to ask Yep. What is God's design for our sexual expression? And and then maybe work on what's a what's a Christ-like posture in which we should hold on to this view. Yeah. A couple of the conversations you address the understanding of scripture and the pushbacks um around things like, well, in those days they didn't understand what we know yeah. or assume now of committed monogamous lifelong same-sex yeah. commitment or there wasn't a thing called homosexuality, that word wasn't used. And frankly, it wasn't even used in biblical translations until what, 1850 something or or, or whatever. Um, And some of the words used in Leviticus and Paul and, and so on. So just talk a little bit about that theology part of it. Sure. Yeah. There, there's, there's actually several arguments I address in the book that are kind of along those lines. They're, they're sort of um, re-examining either the text of scripture or the background surrounding the text and saying, when we gain a better knowledge of the background, the context, these Greek words, then yep. um, the, the, as the argument goes, you know, the traditional understanding of these, of these verses is wrong. The, the, so to take one you alluded to, um, the, the English word homosexual was not in any English translation until the 1946 version of the revised standard version. Um, And that English word is translating. I'm going to get a little technical here. I'll try to be clear. It's translated in a Greek word, arsenokwites. Okay. It doesn't matter. You don't need to know know what that means. I assume people don't. Um, But that Greek word, it's only used. This is the first time it's ever used in all of Greek literature. It's, It's like, it's the only time in the Bible, the only time in Greek literature up until that point. So it's almost like Paul's kind of creating this word. And so there's like, man, we don't even know what this word really means. Yep. Um, and to translate it homosexual, people will say is is just inaccurate. Um, and that's done a lot of damage. It's, it's a mistranslation. And it sort of have has been a cause for why people have been homophobic or harmful towards gay people and so on and so forth. Now, part of this argument, again, is, is actually actually correct. I don't think the English word homosexual is a good translation of arsenokwites. Arsenokwites is actually a common, it's a compound word, meaning it's a combination of two Greek words. The two Greek words are actually very common, arson and koite. Arson is male, koite is bed. And these two Greek words actually occur side by side in Leviticus 18 or 2013, which says a man shall not lie with another male and, and mm-hmm. i'm just kind of paraphrasing the translation but the two greek words are based basically mean uh, a man lying with the male is is how to render these so it seems and this is something that isn't isn't too disputed among scholars on either yeah. side that paul it seems like paul's creating this greek word from that old testament passage and just smashing these two words together what the word basically means then is a man who is having sex is having sex with another male but what does the term homosexual mean? Homosexual simply means somebody who has a same-sex orientation, somebody who is attracted to the same sex. It doesn't actually say 
they are having sex. I mean, just flip it around. I am a heterosexual. That means I'm attracted to females. Does that, did I tell you anything about my sex life? No, I mean, I, you know, um, it just means I'm, I'm attracted. So all that to say, it's absolutely terrible to translate Arsenaco test, which talks about sexual behavior, unrepented sexual behavior, and to translate it with an English word that refers to sexual attraction. So 100% correct. That's a, that's been a bad translation. Now, to be clear, almost every modern English translation doesn't use the term homosexual anymore. I think only the new American standard of the popular translations still uses it, but most, almost every other, other one doesn't. Um, now here's where, just real quick, I know it's taking a little long. Um, when people point out everything I did about this mistranslation, if they say, therefore, yes, <laughs> the Bible doesn't prohibit same-sex marriage, then I'm like, that that's a logical leap that goes far beyond the evidence in this argument. You know, the Bible could use all kinds of different ways of talking about marriage between a man and a woman without using the English term homosexual or homosexuality. Yeah. So um, so I, th I think there is a logical overreach in how this argument is used. And I, this is something I point out in, in that chapter. Yeah. You're talking about something that to me is also kind of foundational to this conversation. And that is the difference between what may be a very real propensity to acting out of the mm -hmm. way God would design and an actual behavior. Who yes. of us does not have a bucket of stuff, stuff that happened to us or whatever, um, or genes or or whatever. And we have a propensity to some sin. God neither gives us license to do that, nor does he, you know, condemn us. It's always a pathway to transformation. Seems like that same thing applies to people where same-sex attraction is part of their bucket of stuff. Maybe the biggest part of their bucket of stuff. I, I agree 100%. And um, I will, I do want to point out that this is very hotly disputed within evangelical circles. Yes. Um, what, and to frame it, um, whether same sex attraction yep. itself is a morally culpable sin. And I'm wording that really specifically because if we just say, is it sin? It's like, well, what do we mean by sin? Or do we mean part of the fallen creation? Well, then yeah, I mean, that, that, you know, we can call it sin in that way, but is it, is it, is it, is if somebody simply experiences an attraction to the same sex, not lust. Okay. Yep. But attraction, yep. I'm attracted to the opposite sex. Doesn't mean I'm lusting after 4 billion people on the planet, you know? Yes. So us straight people will make a clear distinction just between lust and attraction. Um, is that attraction something people need to repent from? And if, if you say yes, then what does repentance look like? Mm -hmm. Opposite sex attraction? Uh, then we're down, down the road of conversion therapy, or is it asexuality and no sexual trapping? If you really think practically, what are we even asking yeah. here? Um, that gets us into, into some interesting conversations, but even biblically, I don't, the Bible clearly prohibits same sex sexual behavior. It really doesn't talk about same sex attraction apart from the behavior. Yeah. And so I, I, I think for, for, for evangelical Christians, I think the best category, they, maybe they might be familiar with with us, is we should think of same-sex attraction as as a temptation, um, like we would my opposite-sex attraction to loads of people who I'm not married to. You know, like that that that's a temptation. Doesn't mean that the fact that I'm simply attracted to females, that that is something I need to repent from and only be attracted to my wife. And when I look, yeah. when I look at another, at another female, I might as well be looking at another male. There's just, there's nothing there. Well, that's just not true. Like that's just not how sexuality yeah. works. So yeah. I want to give gay and lesbian people or same sex attracted people, the same kind of like, <laughs> I want to extend them the same kind of grace that, that we extend our, not grace, but I want to understand their sexuality in a similar way to, to that. Yeah. So uh, yeah. yeah, but, but there's, there's really smart Christians that were just, really disagree with everything I said. So yes. And and I know that's a very hot debate. And this is an area where um my ethical view of what God had designed marriage to be has not changed. And, and maybe in this I share a little bit with you. But my understanding about what the journey is for people who struggle in this in, in this area and the difference between behavior and attraction, um, I don't want to minimize the struggle. But is, is this any different than somebody with a 
predisposition to oh alcoholism or anger and violence or whatever and and again i that that's a little bit conflated and and i want to be you know careful not to assume but that this is an area where where yeah. i myself have come to a whole yeah. i think deeper and and more christ honoring transformation focused perspective on some of these questions i love your language of predisposition because and this is where language does get tricky you know yeah. uh, if we talk about sexual desire then people point out well some desires are sinful some desires do need to be repented of yes and i, and I would agree with that um yes. but i don't think our modern concept of same-sex attraction or opposite sex attraction is exactly the same when the, when the bible talks about sinful desires that do need to be repented from i, I think predisposition because we would all agree that that's that's more in the realm of temptation. I think that's probably a better phrase, actually. Um, and I will say, I, let me just say, if people are like, oh, this is, I haven't thought about this before. I'm not sure where I land. That's totally, I would say, think through it. And, you know, don't don't, yeah. don't feel like you need to believe what we're saying. I will say relationally, I, it, it is a major um, barrier for somebody who is same such attracted, did not choose it, does not want it tried to pray it away for years and years, years, didn't go away. Maybe they went to counseling to make it go away. didn't go away. And they're following They're They're laying that at the feet of Jesus saying, I, out of allegiance to you, I will commit my life to celibacy because this attraction isn't going anywhere for people to say, you need to repent from that. I'm like, well, from what? <laughs> like, right. In right. 2023 for uh, somebody to say out of allegiance to Jesus, I'm committed to celibacy. To, to say, no, you, there's still more you need to do that. That's a, that's a heavy load we're laying on people until you become straight. God is actually not pleased with you. Aside yeah. from whether that's theologically accurate, which I don't think it is relationally that that's a, that's a, that's a big barrier. Um, and, and it's one of the reasons why I think some gay and lesbian people who hold held to a traditional view of marriage, like, all right, I'm done. I just, I can't, yeah, <laughs> I can't exactly. live under this. Like, perpetual shame that's like i'm just a walking bucket of sin until i become straight like i i can't survive in that and i can hold to a traditional view i could even live a life of celibacy but i can't be made to feel that i'm just like living an ongoing sin when i'm committing my life to jesus and laying yeah. down my sexuality at his feet so yeah. yeah someone i think you probably know well jackie hill perry you yeah. probably have heard her say jesus has not promised to make you straight he's yeah. promised to make you holy holy yeah yeah, yeah. She's a great example. Like, who's going to say, yes. <laughs> no, Jackie, you are living an ongoing sin because you still may experience same-sex attraction when she is the most gospel-centered person I think I've ever met. Yeah, yeah. Um, a little bit of a, of a switch. You've been talking about this, working in this area theologically and ministerially for, you know, 10 years plus. Um, what are you seeing? I'm sure you may be getting just maybe volatile pushback from both sides, conservative yeah, Christians yeah. or um, what we might use, you know, progressive Christians. And I hate those labels, yeah. but just a little bit about your experience in, in navigating this. Yeah. Yeah. It has, it's, it's been an interesting journey and, and yeah, I do get um, attacks from both sides. It usually oftentimes it's based on a, on something I didn't say or don't believe, you know, like it's, it's, it's people not really taking the time to uh, read what I have writ written yeah. um, or, or they'll read a critique of me. I've had this, I get this a lot. You know, people will say, well, you believed it. I'm like, where'd you get that from? Well, so-and-so said, I'm like, yeah, that there you go. You know, like I've just never have said that. Don't even believe that. Um, so it's easy for me to brush those off. It's like, you know, whatever, but yeah. So, you know, um, it, it can be, it could be wearing and I don't, I don't know if I built up a resilience or, you know, a lot of the attacks these days is, you know, it's like online stuff. And I just, I just don't live my life in the online world. And, um, I found it, you know, real embodied people, they're, they're, they're more nuanced and gracious than, yeah. than what you see online. So, um, but I get it. You know, I, 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 I understand that, I, I agree. I, I, there's no good term, but for lack of better terms, you know, maybe somebody's progressive and, you know, some might hate my guts, you know, because of the views that I hold to. 
And part of me is like, well, you know, I, I could very easily represent, maybe even just visibly represent somebody in the church who has actually done a lot of genuine harm to this person, you know? And yeah. so I, I understand psychologically if somebody is so deeply angry or hurt, there's usually a story behind that. And yes. and I want to, yes. I want to try to give grace to that. Or even on the conservative end, when people think I'm, you know, going liberal or whatever, you know, <laughs> which is, I've had so many people they hear me actually speak uh -huh. like, yeah, I came really nervous, but man, you're a lot more conservative than I thought you were. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know if that's, a, I don't necessarily need that term, but I don't know. It's yeah. Um, yeah. E even there, there's a lot of, I think, genuine, maybe fear that, that mm -hmm. other Christians might have about where our culture is going or right. how certain Christian leaders have not, you know, held, ha aren't holding firmly to the truth. And that, that can be a lot scary. You, these leaders and 20 years down the road, they come out and changing their view or whatever like that. That's there's a, there's legitimate fear there too. So I, it, it's, it's a complex conversation. So I do, I want to try to give people grace if they respond in less uh, Christ-like ways to the work that I do. Yeah. Oh, awesome conversation, <laughs> Preston. Um, and I feel like we, in some ways are, are, are just getting started. Um, your book, does the Bible support same-sex marriage? 21 conversations from a historically Christian view. Just, um, we've alluded, we've talked about it all, all, all through this conversation, but just specifically, invite people to get the book. Where can they connect with you? Where can they hear yeah. about your thoughts? And you, you, yeah. you're out there a lot, but just, yeah. Yeah. The book just came out. It's uh, available as of August 1st, uh, obviously, wherever books are sold, you know, namely Amazon and a few others, I guess. Yep. <laughs> um, and they can connect. I, I, I'm pretty, um, uh, yeah. So I, I have a, a, a bi-weekly podcast called Theology in the Raw, which, uh, have a lot of conversations about sexuality. Not, not all of them. They talk about everything, but, um, that's something, uh, people can uh, tap into. I've got a couple of websites, um, my own personal website, PrestonSprinkle.com. Also I do. So I run a whole organization called the Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender, CenterForFaith.com. If you're a parent, with an, a kid who identifies as LGBTQ, um, if you're a pastor, a leader who's trying yes. to navigate this conversation, or if you yourself are same-sex attracted and, and trying to figure out what does this mean for your life, we have loads of resources on that website for uh, basically any kind of Christian who wants to engage this, this conversation. Yeah. Well, uh, check the links. If you're watching under this video, if you're listening in the show notes, we'll make sure to have them there. Uh, just awesome conversation preston oh one day we're going to have to have you back and talk about gender that's a whole other oh, conversation yeah. and worth Part talking <laughs> about but i have enjoyed this so much thank you thank you so much for having me on really enjoyed it as well wow it was like preston and i were just getting started and we could have gone uh twice as long i invite you to check the links under this video we'll have the links there to preston's website to the center for faith sexuality and gender to the theology and the raw podcast and to his book does the bible support same-sex marriage 21 conversations from a historically christian view i know if you are still watching that this has stirred some things in you i hope it has um i, I hope it has brought some goodness uh, maybe it's challenged some of your ideas if this is a personal thing for you, which I know it is for many, either in your own experience or perhaps in your family, um, I want to honor you in the journey and the wrestling and very likely the struggle that this has been for you. I would love to interact with you personally. Leave a comment or a question under this video. I read every one. If you'd like to connect with me confidentially, come over to our website, drcarolministries.com. You can use the contact page there and leave me a confidential message. We'll also link to a couple articles that I have written about intimacy, uh, the difference between intimacy and sex, and what it means to pursue intimacy at the heart level. And we're not talking about marriage here, but intimacy. Intimacy and sex are related, but not the same. Preston talked about that, and I've written some about that. I'm going to link to an article about disentangling those things, and I think you will find that helpful. 
thanks so much for being with me in this conversation. And until next time, may God bless you.